it just represents the work you've put in. I'd rather you show up with a good attitude and, and not have your belt than to show up with your belt and have the wrong attitude. Hey there, everyone. It's episode 38 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists, like today's guest, Master Tanya Panizo. I'm your host, Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm also Whistlekick's founder. Here at Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear and some great apparel and accessories for traditional martial artists. I'd like to welcome our new listeners and thank all of the returning fans. If you're not familiar with our products, you should check out what we offer, like our polyester no-sweat t-shirts. They're comfortable and lightweight, making them a great base layer under your martial arts uniform, or for working out in the gym, or even just wearing around the house. They come in six colors, including my favorite, the red. You can learn more about our line of no-sweat shirts and the rest of our great gear and apparel at whistlekick.com. All of our past podcast episodes, show notes for this one, and a lot more are over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And while you're on our website, why don't you sign up for our newsletter? We offer exclusive content to subscribers, and it's the only place to find out about the upcoming guests. And now for today's episode. On episode 38, we're joined by Master Tanya Panizo, a Taekwondo practitioner from Michigan. Master Panizo was a passionate, lifelong martial artist, even leaving a lucrative job to pursue martial arts as a full-time career. As anyone who has made martial arts their career knows, it's not the easiest way to make a living, but that's just a sign of Master Panizo's passion. As a school owner, tournament promoter, coach, instructor, and entrepreneur, she has a lot to talk about. So with that, Master Panizo, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to have you, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. Me too. Yeah, awesome. Well, let's jump in the way we always do. Tell us how you got into the martial arts and why. Okay, let's see. Well, uh, I'm a triplet. I have two brothers the same age as myself. And my dad just wanted me to be able to scrap, wanted me to be, to be, be a tough girl. And uh, he wanted us to do some form of martial art. And Taekwondo was available, you know, about 10 miles away or so. And I did not want to do it. I was pretty athletic. I was doing other sports. And he drove us down there. My brothers couldn't wait to do it. And I did not want to do it. And he signed me up. He said I had to do it for about a month or so. After a couple of weeks, I was hooked. I was addicted. I wanted to go to every single class. And that was about the age of eight. I had, had just turned eight years old. And my brothers and I you know, were then doing Taekwondo pretty much about three or four days a week at that time. And I originally started under Grandmaster Ron Rose. He was Mr. Rose at the time. He's Grandmaster Ron Rose now. And spent about 25 years in his organization being trained by him. He's a great instructor. And um, that was still in the same area in which I lived. Spent most of my time with him, competing with him. There really weren't a lot of kids at that time. I'm sure you've probably heard that before. Not a lot of kids in the 80s. We're talking like early 80s. So it was really challenging because we were training with adults, with the exception of my brothers, who always just partnered up with each other. So I was like the odd one out all of the time. Sure. And uh, then there was just that sibling competitiveness. So the car rides home were always really interesting. Um, but I spent a lot of time there, did demonstrations, tournaments, a lot of class time, really enjoyed it, loved it. And um, like I said, spent about 25 years with Grandmaster Rose. So it was well into adulthood that I ended up becoming an independent um, martial arts owner. Um, but that's a uh, Taekwondo. The style was Chung Do Kwan. I'm still Chung Do Kwan today, um, even with my students that I teach at my school. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So what created such a dramatic change at, at age eight? I mean, we're going back a couple of years, mm -hmm. but if you maybe you remember... You didn't want to do it, and then within a month, you're hooked? What happened in there? You know what? I think about that, and I oftentimes talk with my students about that. I think it was the structure. I thrive on structure, and I think that in, in particular, martial arts uh, back then in the early 80s, which was much more military-like. I don't want to say we certainly have structure today and discipline, but you know, classes were two hours long. You stayed after for another 45 minutes to fight extra matches. And I really loved the structure. So the lining up, the order, knowing what to expect, but at the same time, knowing there was going to be something new every class, 
is what I really thrived on. And I think too, <clears throat> for me, I was that kid who just wanted to do everything herself. You know, like what, I'm sure when I was four, it, you know, if my mom wanted to help me tie my shoe, I would swat her hand and say, I do it. I tie my own shoe. You know, I was probably one of those kids because it was such a challenge to be training with all of those adults who really didn't treat you like a kid that I just, I wanted to do it. No matter how hard it was, I wanted to do it. And I think um, there were days when I did not want to go because I knew it would be so hard, but at the same time, I wasn't going to not go. And uh, I think that that is just how my personality is, that I'm not a really, really afraid to take risks and I rise to a challenge. I think that's who I am even today. And I think that's really what it was back then. It must have been in my genes. <laughs> well, you're certainly not the first martial artist to thrive on structure. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in recent interviews, we've talked a little bit about, you know, almost profiling children and mm -hmm. why do they gravitate towards martial arts and and a desire for structure, which is pretty common amongst most kids, I'd say, yep. is certainly one of the elements that hooks them. I agree. I agree. So you know, because you've listened to the show before, that we're all about stories here. Yes. So I'd love for you to tell us your best martial arts story. So that is a tough question. And I'm sure everybody has said that to you, right? That that They have, because absolutely. The, you know, because there's like your best story about competition or your best story about, I don't know, persevering, your best story about teaching. So it seems like it would be so difficult. And when I think about that, uh, it's really hard to pinpoint it to one thing. But I, I do recall two stories that I think <laughs> really resonate with me. One. Well, give us both then. Well, one is just related to, to training. So I was probably about maybe 13 or 14 years old and I was doing a training camp. Maybe I was younger than that. Actually, I think it was about 12. And it was a weekend training camp at my instructor's facility. And there were all of these other students and instructors coming from the New England area, from Connecticut. And I'm sure part of them were uh, from the Vermont and Maine area as well. It was that whole group. And they'd come out to Michigan for this training camp. And it was a two-day workshop. And as I mentioned before, there just really weren't a lot of kids. You know, a lot of them were like the owner's kids and uh you know, just, it wasn't, and certainly no girls, you know what I mean? I've been fighting boys my, my whole life, but <laughs> uh, starting with my brothers, right? But we went to this training camp and we, it was all open fighting, you know, like sweeping the leg, punching to the face. It was just, uh, you know, a lot of that was involved in the camp. Well, I remember I was hit by this right cross to the right side of my face by a 35 year old man from Connecticut. I'll never forget it because I don't even know his name. All I know is a 35 year old man from Connecticut. He hit me with this right cross and, uh, and I dropped, you know, and I got back up and um, I don't know, I felt like probably Tweety Birds over my head at that time, but got back up, just kept on trucking. Well, I ended up having a big shiner. I mean, literally like a black eye. And I remember my dad was kind of nursing it that night. And as he's nursing it, telling me, why didn't I have my hands up? You know, <laughs> so that was kind of like how my dad was, right? Sure. Well, I showed up to day two of the camp, you know, and I had to laugh because as we lined up and, and the guys were walking out, there were two other people with shiners on the same eye from the same guy. <laughs> so there were three of us with these black eyes. And I was just, I, I think back to that because I was like, what the heck happened? You know what I mean? The same guy uh, gave us all a black eye and, and I had to show up to school that, that Monday. Oh. Imagine explaining that. But, yeah. uh, but to me, that was such a funny story because clearly we were all vulnerable to whatever it was he was doing in that match. And um, I guess it felt kind of good not to be alone. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, that, was one, that was one that I felt um, I thought was a great story because it was such a tough camp. And uh, I guess I, I guess I have a really good memory about it. Someone that sticks out the most. It's certainly vivid for you, and and uh, it's vivid for for me too. I can certainly see that. Yeah. I'm I'm wondering, would was any um, justice dealt out to this gentleman? Well, you know what was funny is because as we were fighting the next day, um, you know, I, I never held back. I was never afraid. I think you know I was just going to go for it, and I tried. I tried to, some retribution, but you know. <laughs> 
I, I do remember him kind of laughing and putting his arms up as I was kind of tearing after him, but it was, it was all in fun. You know what I mean? It was uh, certainly nothing bad about that, but it was a really good camp. We learned a lot. If nothing else, I, I know what it's like to have a black eye at this point, at, at the age of 12. <laughs> Um, I think my other story is something that I use um, all the time in my gym because I'm sure, as you know, with uh, a lot of kids in the gym these days, which was different back then, um, you know, kids are coming and going at a rate that is so much uh, faster paced than we did. And sometimes they forget their gear, they forget their belt. And, and I remember somebody forgetting their belt years ago when I was training. And I remember um, a visiting instructor had said to him, um, walked over to him and took off his wedding ring and uh, gave it to the kid who's like a teenager. And he said, I want you to hold this. And, um, and he said, well, why? And he said, why? I just want to ask you, because I took that off. Does that mean I'm not married anymore? Because the kid had forgot his belt. So he's freaking out because he's probably gonna do like a hundred pushups or something. Right. And, uh, and he said, well, no. And he said, does this mean that because I'm not wearing it that I shouldn't respect and honor my wife? And he asked, asked him a few questions about that. And he said, well, no. And he said, it's the same thing with your belt. It just represents the work you've put in. But I'd rather you show up with a good attitude and, and not have your belt than to show up with your belt and have the wrong attitude. And I remembered that because with kids today, forgetting things and um, freaking out about getting push-ups. I don't have my belt. And, and the focus is oftentimes with the kids about their belt, right? Like that's something that they do sometimes obsess on. And we have to remind them, and I, I use that story sometimes too, that it really is just a symbol or a representation of everything that they've learned. And even when they're not wearing it, they need to really walk that walk. So that was a really meaningful story that I remember that I actually still use as I teach today. That's a great story and a wonderful anecdote and one that I think a lot of younger kids can understand in a way that, you know, sometimes the the way a lot of us explain mm -hmm. the significance of rank, they, they may not grasp that. Right. So mm -hmm. that's a great story. Thank you for sharing mm -hmm. that. So obviously you've spent a lot of time in the martial arts. Mm -hmm. and it's pretty much molded you into who you are. But if you could imagine your life now without having gone through the martial arts, what do you think that might look like? Gosh, I actually thought about that the other day. I really don't know. I think I have a lot of, um, like I have an attraction or an affinity to order. So I think perhaps, you know, I might have found my way towards some other uh, activity that has a lot of structure and order. Um, I did go to college. I didn't go into the military. Uh, who knows? Maybe I would have pursued the military, something that that gave me that same feeling. I, I really can't even imagine it because it has been such a fulfilling part of my life. And and I left my, you know, my engineering job to do this full time as far as teaching and owning a school. And I don't think I could even imagine ever going back to that because while I was good at my job and I did enjoy it, it wasn't as emotionally fulfilling as this is. So um, it's very hard to imagine my life without without Taekwondo in it. And that certainly sounds like a little bit of a sacrifice. I mean, I'm not going to mm -hmm. ask you to reveal any numbers, but one might imagine that an engineer, someone who's good at their job, mm -hmm. probably makes a decent income. And mm -hmm. uh, I know there are a lot of martial arts school owners listening to this right now. And <laughs> I think we all know. Oh, yes. I ran a school that it is not the easiest way to – make a lot of money. No. Uh, in fact, it might be one of the hardest. It, that's very true. And uh, that was a sacrifice. But I think that as long as you are true to why you're doing the martial arts, you know, not to make a buck or uh, if you're really wanting to help others, kids, adults, teenagers, you know, enjoy something that you enjoy and reap the benefits that, that you reaped out of the martial arts, then I think that if you employ patience, which is part of the martial arts, then at the end of the day, you'll you'll be where you want to be, uh, working through those struggles and those sacrifices for sure. I agree. So why don't you think now about a, a point in your life that maybe wasn't as great, not quite as rosy as 
I'm going to assume the majority of your time in the martial arts has been. Mm-hmm. And think about that rough patch and how your martial arts training and experience helped you move through it. Mm-hmm. I think that the most difficult period for me was when I was going through my divorce. I had uh, just had my daughter. She was only one years old. I was going through a divorce. The gym had only been open nine months. Uh, the gym in my town, that is. And, you know, so it was a startup. We were struggling. As as I mentioned, I left my, my high-paying job to do it. So I had a lot of uh, challenges. And to me... The gym was like my sanctuary. You know, a home was stressful. You know, it was, uh, I had a small child and trying to, you know, pay the bills. And um, you'd think that that would be like your resting spot. But it really wasn't. The dojang was. It gave me something to dive into, something to work towards, to build up, to put a lot of my emotional energy in and to cultivate. And, you know, I would literally go to the gym for peace. Um, at that time. So I think, you know, when you can, you know, kick a bag or uh, fight a couple of matches and and exert some of that emotional energy, and then at the same time, dive into the business. And that's when I really did realize that that gym, my gym was my sanctuary, it really got me through some really rough times. And I tell my students that as well, you know, like, you having a rough day at work, you know, put put it all out on the mat you know, let it all go, let this be your time. Um, and, and that's how they usually end up going home feeling better. Wow. Talk about a, a life reboot. <laughs> I mean, those, those are three huge things, things that would be stressful on their own. Sure. And, and then you stacked them all up within a year. That's, I know. That's, wow. Yeah. That's heavy. It is pretty heavy. But, you know, and people ask me, you know, what was the secret to the success? And I honestly, I feel, uh, you know, in the one Batman movie where he's trying to, he's trying to climb out of that big pit or whatever, and he keeps putting, putting the rope on and, uh, keeps falling, keeps falling. And the one guy said, if you want to, if you want to get out, you got to cut the rope. You got to climb up there without the rope. You know, like there, there's no option. There's nothing there to save you, you know? And I feel like I just really didn't have an option. You know, and it was one of those moments where you apply your tenets, right? You persevere, you maintain a strong spirit. There's no one there to catch you. I didn't have my engineering paycheck to rely on. I didn't have, you know, a partner to to help me babysit. So it was, I cut the rope. And I think that that's really uh, was one of the key ingredients, you know, uh, to the success of the gym. I would agree. As, you know, it's certainly not a secret. Whistlekick is a small company. We're a startup company. Mm -hmm. And so I'm spending a lot of time listening to the advice, reading books and and listening to podcasts from experts on business growth and and motivation and things like that. And one of the things they've said is exactly what you've said and how critical that is, that if you're really looking to succeed, that trying to – increment and baby steps and you know get everything lined up so it's not as difficult it's not as painful for most people the majority of the time it doesn't work that way you've got to jump that's right you've got to show the world and show yourself that you believe in what you're doing Mm -hmm. and jump in with both feet absolutely awesome well clearly it's worked out Mm -hmm. yeah because you're here talking to me now. You don't have that engineering job. Right. School's going well. Yep. And your daughter? She's nine. Awesome. She's awesome, but, you know, I'm her mom, so I think she's the best kid <laughs> on the planet. So You do kind of have to say of that. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. And it's always nice when things work out that way. Yep. And certainly with martial arts experience tends to be that perseverance, that attitude that – does lend itself to the rest of the world pretty well. Mm -hmm, I agree. So I'd like you to tell us a little bit about the people that influenced you in the martial arts. Who, who might you say has been the most influential? Um, you know, I think when I was young, you know, considering I was dragged into the, my first dojang, (laughs) um, I have to give my dad some credit because you know, my dad ended up 
being my my rock, the one I could rely on. You know, the one who uh, shielded me from any Taekwondo politics that were going on at the time, which I didn't learn about until I was older, but just allowed me to train. Uh, he was also my, uh, how do I say, he would check me, right? Check the ego. So when I was winning tournaments and stuff and, you know, he made it very clear that, you know, it's not about being the best. You know what I mean? It's about you doing your best. And uh, so he was ma very clear to make that happen. So he was very influential. He always made sure that I was mentally prepared, physically prepared. He he was, um, I guess what you might call, you know, like a, what a coach would be today. Because back then we didn't have coaches. You know, you just went out and right. fought. Um, but he was... He was always looking out for me. He was very influential in my training. I think, of course, you know, as I got into the martial arts, you know, I like watched every Bruce Lee movie on the planet. So I was <laughs> like, you know, uh, was definitely influenced by a big poster Bruce Lee on my bedroom wall. I'm sure all my friends nice. had some teen throb and I had like Bruce Lee up <laughs> in the wall. <laughs> but I think the two of them have been, you know, really influential as I was, you know, going through the ranks. I think today, it's uh, the friendships that I've made. You know, Russ Gale, who's my business partner here at the gym, um, has kind of taken that role over as mentor friend. Master White, you know, they they are very, um, I don't want to say even influential, but supportive of what I do and are good sounding boards for me. I think having that sounding board in your life is really important, especially the more successful someone gets. Yep. You listen to any really high level people. You listen to Richard Branson. I mean, he's got people that he bounces things off of and, you know, who, who wouldn't want to bounce things off Richard Branson? Mm -hmm. We think of him as, you know, or Bill Gates or these other tremendously successful, mm -hmm. very intelligent people. And it's critical, I think, to have that in your life. So it's great that you've identified who those folks are. Mm -hmm. Yep. So you've just mentioned competition a little bit. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. How did competition factor into your life? Well, I think I grew up with some underlying form of competition, just being a triplet, right? Like, and I got out first. So I feel like I won, <laughs> I won that first competition. I was the firstborn. You're the oldest. <laughs> I'm the oldest. Um, but, you know, as far as Taekwondo competition, you know, it started – at a time where, again, there really were not a lot of kids. Like I said, school owners, kids, and, uh, you know, there certainly were no girls. I, I literally spent the first five years in tournaments fighting boys. And then, you know, you had the two two things to deal with. One is the, the boys that didn't want to fight you because you were a girl. And then the ones that uh, didn't want to lose to a girl. You know what I mean? So, like, would go out like crazy all to make sure they won, you know, um, I, I would, you know, I'll, I'll say I was good. And I, I, I don't want to even say so much as I was good as I was tough. And I think oftentimes for me, when I think back, it almost wasn't always about even my technical ability as much as it was my will. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. I just had a stronger will. Like I was not, going to lose or I was not going to, you know, um, not advance through the, through the bracket. So I, um, you know, I really did enjoy the competition and it started out with point fighting and then it moved into what's now called the Olympic style, obviously, um, as Taekwondo moved into the Olympics, did, did quite a lot of national competitions, you know, to try to try to compete nationally and, um, really, really enjoyed it. I have to say. What was your favorite part about competition? Um, well, one, I, I think when I was younger, it was just about surviving. Because like I said, you know, 15-year-old boys and 15-year-old girls are different. It was just about, you know, um, I, I didn't even really have clear goals back then other than to, I just did the tournament. I think when I was older, I think the best part was pursuing the goal, which was to win a national championship or a team spot. You know what I mean? As you get older, you understand the process a little bit better. So I think that was something that I enjoyed because again, being structured and driven with structured, I, I liked the process towards, you know, trying to make a national team and I could see it clearly. And I worked toward that goal. 
I responded to to those goals. So I think that is what I liked best about it. It wasn't like uh, just recreation, sparring in the dojang you know, without a clear goal, you know. So I think that's what I liked best about competition. Okay. And, and how did that quest for a, a team spot go? Uh, well, I never made the national team. Um, won some state championships. Um, went to, that was back when state championships were, you know, were pretty massive events. Yep. Um, I even tore off a cast in a doctor's office to be able to fight in the national <laughs> championships. I took it off four weeks early. I was supposed to have it on for eight weeks. I broke two bones in my hand and I got into an argument with him because I was going to that national championship. And um, like I said, I think that I was a contender for a lot of the really good players, the ones that did make national team. Like the one that um, everybody just always had on their radar because I could be that one that kept them in pursuit of what their goal was. Um, but no, nope, never made a national team. Uh, but still just loved the competition. Loved it. Good. Good. Do you have... You mentioned earlier stories out of competition. Is there one that you might want to share with us? Well, I remember clearly in competition the first time I broke somebody's nose and it bled everywhere. Ooh. So I always tell parents who are always afraid of, and I was like a teenager, but I, I was a little older, but I re, when, when parents are upset about their kids getting hit in the head or hit in the face, yeah, you know, and I, I value that concern. But I always tell them too, you have to remember, you know, your kid's going to be affected also the first time they like wreck somebody's face, <laughs> you know? And I mean, I mean, I've been like knocked around and hit in the head so many times. So it was like, yeah, whatever. But the first time in a competition that I dropped an ax kick on somebody's face and that nose just bled everywhere. I, I mean, I'd seen blood, I'd seen it all in the dojo, but the first time that I did that to someone else, uh, it stunned me in the middle of the match. You know what I mean? Um, and I just remember, you know, having to kind of like reset myself um, and not let that nurturing side of me go, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Did, did I do that? <laughs> you know, and be happy that I did it. And, you know, hey, let's try to do that again. Right. Like the coach would say. Right. So, right. Uh, but to me, that was probably memorable because I, it, it was like I tell these parents, like it's one thing to get wrecked. It's another thing to wreck someone else. Right. So. Almost harder sometimes, sometimes to yeah. inflict that pain on others. Yep. But at the end of the day, right, it's always uh, it's always better when yours is, you know, the nose that isn't broken. So <laughs> Ultimately, I, yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I do remember that in competition. Great. You've had a chance to train with some pretty great people, and you mentioned some names that, you know, certainly mean a lot to you. But if you could train with someone else that you haven't, be they alive or not, who would that be? Um, I think for me, uh, I would like to, well, of course, I would, if Bruce Lee were still alive, it would just be cool to see what he's really like. Yeah. You know what I mean? You just have this perception of him and, uh, but it would be cool to see what he's really like. And I know sometimes people will make fun, oh, Bruce Lee or this or that, you know, come on, come on. You know, meaning like he's just thinking more of like the movies. But um, I think that he had so much innovation for the time. And I would love to have seen like what he actually did training wise without a camera around, you know, it'd be fantastic. Um, certainly too, like, I mean, just on the boxing end, like Muhammad Ali, I would love to, uh, because I like all striking arts and, um, I have a blue belt in jiu-jitsu as well. So I, I, I love all martial arts. I value all of them. And it's outside of even just, um, the kicking arts. I think it would be great to just be in their presence. Um, maybe even just watch them train, you know, yeah. if you couldn't train with them, I think that I would really be able to to gain a lot of knowledge and appreciation just by observing, let alone training with them. Cool. Yeah, that, that would be fun. I mean, it's amazing how many great people have come through. I mean, even mm -hmm. if you just look, look now, the number of people on the landscape that are amazing martial artists that are, are so far beyond anything that I will ever attain mm -hmm. that I would love to train with. I could spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you know, train a day with one person and never, never even 
finish off that list. Right, right. So you mentioned Bruce Lee, so I'm going to – and Bruce Lee poster. So I'm going to guess <laughs> you know, that – You brought that back up again. I did. I did bring that back up. Had to. And he was in the yellow jumpsuit, you know, of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <With> the... <laughs> have, have you seen the video of the little kid? The Nunchaku doing – doing um the reenactment from and en- that scene in enter the dragon no oh, i'll have to send that okay. to you I'll put that in show notes it's this he's got to be three okay and there's a big screen tv behind him playing that scene oh, and i'm pretty sure it's enter the dragon with, with the yellow and yep. the nunchuck mm-hmm. and he's doing it oh my gosh and his his timing is spot on really? this kid must have done this a thousand times. Yeah, I mean, this clearly was staged, okay. and there was a lot of practice that went into it, but it's utterly amazing. Oh, my gosh. So I'll, I'll send you the link when we're done. Okay, okay. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> so, <laughs> other than that, which I'm sure you're going to love when you see it, uh, how about martial arts movies? Do you have some favorites? Um, <laughs> well, uh, you know, I grew up, so this, this is another way my dad and I bonded through the martial arts. So every Saturday night at 11 o'clock was the martial arts theater. And it had all those uh, movies you couldn't even name today, you know, where they were all dubbed over. crazy. And every once in a while, they'd have a Bruce Lee one. And that was like the one to stay up and watch. But every Saturday night, we'd watch martial arts theater. And then at midnight would be like the horror movies, right? Um, just on like regular television. So I literally for probably four years out of my life every Saturday was watching you know Kung Fu theater or whatever Um, but I think now that I've gotten older uh, you know uh, Enter Enter the Dragon for sure Crouching Tiger Hidden Dragon was awesome some strong females in there which I really love Um, especially now that I get older I can have an appreciation for that so I think probably those two but I, I mean I love any martial arts movie come on you know, anything with Jackie Chan in it because he makes me laugh, you know, um, that has the entertainment value, sure. you know, for sure. Is Jackie your favorite actor? He is my favorite actor. actor. Because, you know, when he smiles, you smile. I, I mean, really, he's got great comedic timing, plus, you know, some fight skills to back it up for sure. And so yeah. I think he for sure is my favorite martial arts actor. He's a great and, actor, a, and a good absolutely. actor in general. You know, I don't want to stereotype him as a martial arts guy, you know, martial arts actor. He's a good actor in general. Yeah. And and he's a singer, too. A lot of people don't know I that. I did not know that. And and I don't know if he's a better singer than – I'm assuming you've probably seen the Rush Hour movies. Mm-hmm. Yep. He does some singing in there, which is absolutely terrible. So I'm I'm assuming that when he's actually trying to sing, he's far better. I mm-hmm. can't say that I've seen it. but Well, I mean, well, I hey, Bruce Lee was a dancer, right? So, I mean, he was a, it wasn't he like a ballroom dancing champion or something. He was, I, I have, yeah, I've heard that actually. Yeah. So let me, let me, I'll, I'll see if I can find something to back that up. Mm-hmm. I think he, I think he like won a bunch of competitions or something. And like before he ever got started in the martial arts. Certainly there's, there's a lot of great footwork in there. Maybe, <laughs> yeah. maybe, maybe we should all be taking some ballroom <laughs> dance classes. Yeah. To improve our sparring. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, I think it's like one of those little known facts about him. Like, I don't know, like he was like a, you know, some kind of a dancing champion or something. I don't know. How about books? Are you a reader? I am a, oh gosh, a very big reader. Okay. Uh, I'm not big on media, so I don't watch a lot of television or movies even too much today, but I do read a lot. Um, martial arts wise, you know, um, Living the Martial Way is a great book. You know, I, I like that book a lot. And um, Hagakuri, the book of the samurai, is very good as well. It's an easy read, short read. Oh, actually, I shouldn't say it's an easy read, but it's a short read. You know, I do a lot of self-defense and safety training through another company that I run. And um, Gavin DeBecker has two great books that I think are related to self-defense and safety that not only martial artists can appreciate, but um, those that don't do martial arts, that protecting the gift is one and the gift of fear is another one i would highly recommend those books okay and of course we'll have links to those and everything else we talk about mm-hmm. over at the website whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for those of you that might be new mm-hmm. so 
you're a structured person and most structured people tend to be goal oriented. Mm -hmm. Is that that a a fair assessment for you? Definitely. Probably an understatement to some degree. (laughs) I have a feeling, you know, I don't like to be too heavy handed with my (laughs) my assessment of the guests. You don't want to be presumptuous. I understand. I don't. I don't. Absolutely. So I'm sure you've got a bunch of goals. Are there any martial arts goals you'd be willing to share with us? Well, here at Midwest, which is where my uh, Midwest Taekwondo is the gym here in in the Plymouth, Michigan area, we are now um, getting involved in a lot of after school enrichment programming here. It's um, it's not really after school latchkey. So uh, it's more community service minded, trying to take a group of kids after school and apply these five tenets of Taekwondo, you know, courtesy, integrity, perseverance, self-control, strong spirit, and and help guide them in applying these things to daily life through community service. So we have about eight kids right now. We're in the first year of that particular program and uh, really giving them some meaning to the after school hours. They're actually uh, wrapping up their first community service project this week and um, really just trying to to take what is great about martial arts, which outside of the physical realm, right? Outside of all the physical fitness benefits and self-defense yeah. benefits and apply it to to kids in the community. So we're we're employing that right now in our community and we're hoping to grow that as well ultimately trying to get into the education space in a way that we have never really done before is taking those same five pillars and five tenets into the schools. And that's really where we're headed for the next five years. That sounds great. Mm -hmm. And make sure you keep us up to date on that. You know, we're happy to share that information as that's going on, because it sounds like something that as it grows, others might be interested Mm -hmm. in replicating if you offer some kind of option. Yep for that yep. what else because i'm sure that's not it um well there's got to be more <laughs> there has to be more well i mean uh, as i mentioned i also run a safety company uh it's called fighting spirit safety and i'll tell you the reason why i did that was you love martial arts i love martial arts you know i got a lot of students that love martial arts but i always go back to there are so many benefits of the martial arts that we can really reach another group of individuals um, if we just remove it from the martial arts arena. And I, I say that through the with the the enrichment program for the schools involves kids that are not doing martial arts, but they are learning these five pillars, these five tenets of Taekwondo, right? So those are things that they would be getting in our dojang uh, with kicking and punching, but these kids don't want to do Taekwondo. They do soccer, they do this, they do that, but we're still in some way impacting them with a found, the foundational elements of Taekwondo, right? So the safety company is really the same way. You know, my mom doesn't want to do Taekwondo three days a week, but she does need and want some self-defense and safety skills. So the company was really created to remove what a lot of people perceive as a long-term committed avenue towards obtaining self-defense skills. So my my next goal, the company has been running since 2007, and it's been uh, very successful, but my next goal is to take that to the next level. We've been going to, you know, universities, uh, sororities. We obviously run programs here. We, I mean, I speak for corporations, large corporations, but my goal is to really try to to bring that to the community in such a way that we no longer have to think about where to go for self-defense. I I think if you asked any female on the street, where would you go to get a self-defense class? Nobody really has a good answer to that. You know what I mean? I guess, I don't know, maybe the police department or, you know, maybe a karate school. Like there's really no clear answer to that. Um, And I really don't um, want that valuable knowledge that comes from the martial arts, right? Those martial skills to be only for those that sign up for Taekwondo. So my, my next goal is to really take that avenue, like that pr- particular part of uh, Taekwondo and martial skills and all of that, uh, the ground fighting I learned in jujitsu as well, to people who don't necessarily want to sign up at my school. That's wonderful. Mm-hmm. And I don't remember a lot of the specifics. I believe it came out of Canada. There was a study that was completed and they found that the number one way to reduce violent assaults on women at universities, you know, so mm-hmm. that that age group right there was to give them some self-defense training. Mm-hmm. And it was pretty cut and dry. You know, it's something we've always 
known, mm-hmm. but now there's some data, at least according to this study, yep. that backs that up. Yep. There's there's quite a bit of data that, that does show that. And I think that as long as we take a proactive approach to it, and I go back to um, not everybody wants to to take Taekwondo or, or another martial art three or four days a week, but, you know, they do need some of the things that we teach in Taekwondo or, or the other martial arts, you know, in a, in a condensed and comprehensive program. So that's, that is my next goal and um, working towards that right now. Wonderful. Mm-hmm. And if someone wants to learn more about these programs that you've got going on, or they want to reach out to you and, you know, email, whatever, how, how can people find out more about you? Um, the two best ways would be to go to the websites, um, MidwestTaekwondo.com is my Dojang website, and then FightingSpiritSafety.com is the safety company website for those that um, are not enrolled in martial arts programs but want adrenal-based self-defense training. Those are the two best ways. You can email me through either of those websites um, or call me at the gym. Okay. Great, and we'll post links to those. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Of course. You're welcome. Thank you. Any parting advice for those listening? Well, I think if I could just offer up a couple of comments um, and and tell my students oftentimes to just live live their lives intentionally. You know, I mean, with uh, some intent. And even if that means you're just relaxing, right, that that you are living with some purpose and to be grateful for the things that they have. I think that's something, that gratitude is something that people say but don't truly practice and appreciate. I oftentimes tell my students, you know, instead of worrying on the belt or worrying about your promoting and your ranking, be present in the moment. What, what do your feet feel like when they step onto the mat? Like, have you really thought about how that how that feels and be present in the moment? And I think that that is when they're really going to enjoy their journey and reach their goals in in a much um, in a much more productive way than if they were um, just checking things off of the list. And I came from checking things off the list, right? I'm obviously very goal oriented, but it wasn't until um, I really learned how to live in in the present, you know what I mean, to be present on the mat that I began to really appreciate everything that I have already done. Uh, you know what I mean? And and uh, and sometimes people just look too far ahead all the time and uh, can't really be grateful for all of the thing, the hard work that they've already put in and and all that's been given to them. So I think that that's really it is to just live intentionally, enjoy the moment, be present. And um, and realize that everybody's path is different, you know, and that's what's so great about being a unique individual on the planet, right? Without a doubt. Mm-hmm. Really appreciate your time, and thanks so much for being here. No, thank you so much. Thanks for listening to episode 38 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and thank you to Master Panizo. Head on over to WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com for the show notes with links to everything we talked about, including Fighting Spirit Safety, Master Panizo's Women's and Children's Self-Defense Program. While you're there, if you want to be a guest on the show or you know someone that would be a great interview, please fill out the guest form. And don't forget to subscribe to our exclusive newsletter. If you want to follow us on social media, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, all with the username Whistlekick. If you like the show, please subscribe so you never miss out in the future. And if we could trouble you to help us out briefly, please leave us a five-star review wherever you download your podcasts. If we read your review on the air, just contact us and we'll get you a free pack of Whistlekick stuff. And don't forget to spread the word about our show to anyone that you think might like it. Remember the great stuff we make at Whistlekick, like our great lightweight no-sweat line of t-shirts, available at whistlekick.com. So, until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.